Um, yeah, this stuff is amazing. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know what it means, but when I started this course, I was I was thinking, you know, this course is like not going to be fun to teach because it's and uh, I mean, we haven't got the heaviest stuff yet. <laughs> We're going to get to some of it soon, like read later, Du Bois or whatever. But um, still, it's kind of serious. But I don't know. I'm still, have, I, I think it's still fun. Uh, maybe that says something bad about me, actually. But in any case, uh, um, so, OK, so Volcarine and Claire. So, uh, Although I think you can feel that like she's having fun, actually. I mean, there's different authors, but she is, right? So anyway, um, her father was uh, um, it's kind of complicated. But he was basically like a Belgian immigrant, um, Belgian slash French. And at the time she was born, he was a free thinker and an atheist, and so. He named her after Voltaire. That's how she got the name Voltaire. Um, but later he decided to um, become a like uh, um, really fanatic Catholic, <laughs> and uh, he wanted her to become a nun. <laughs> He uh, enrolled her in a convent school in Ontario. They they lived in Michigan, so you know, like just right nearby. Um, from which at one point she actually tried to escape from. <laughs> she like swam across the river, and <laughs> so in any case, um, um, and I mean, I mentioned that first of all because it's interesting, but second of all because uh, I think I mean. It's clear that 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 she and I think like taking after her father apparently. I mean, actually, this in the Wikipedia article they quote Emma Goldman as talking about her quote religious zeal that is declares religious zeal for the anarchist cause, um, which stamped everything she did. So I mean, there is something like that going on, and and I think she's aware of that. She right? She's not. Uh, she's not trying to hide that, or um, she's she's somehow trying to make it that work. Actually, um, she basically spent her whole life, which was relatively short, as a right. She died when she was, I guess, forty. But 45, that doesn't work. Can't do math. All right, without a computer. Uh, so anyway, she died when she was relatively young. She spent basically her whole life as like an activist, author, and speaker. Um, so this is what she did. Although I, I also found out um, also from the Wikipedia article that uh, in the later part of her life, she lived for quite a while with Jewish immigrants in Philadelphia, and she actually learned how to speak and write Yiddish. <laughs> I don't know if we have any Yiddish writings by her. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's um, that's just general background about her. More specifically about her thought, there was definitely a lot of evolution in her thoughts. Um, and uh, she started off as um, closer to the type of anarchist that here she calls individualist, right? Which is basically a kind of libertarian 
very like radical libertarian type of anarchism. Um, but uh, she um, she moved over time and and ended up maybe at least in some ways closer to communist anarchism. Um, most of that happened. Uh, before the earliest thing that in our reading, which is the anarchism thing from 1901. Um, but it seems like there may still be further changes going on between 1901 and 1910. Um, um, especially if you compare what she says in the dominant idea. Well, I mean, that's, I guess that's what I mean by 1910, right? There were three. All right, there are three things by her in the reading. Anarchism, anarchism and American tradition. Traditions. Traditions, I guess. And the dominant idea. So this was 1901. This is 1908, I think. This is 1910. Um, so, may, I mean, so it may be a little dangerous to try to put together an overall view by putting together these three things because she may have changed her mind in between. Um, but I do think I can, I, I, I do think, you know, at least I hope I can use these three essays to illuminate, illuminate each other somewhat. Um, I also, like, I find actually kind of unexpectedly that I feel like I'm going to talk about this more than the other two. And it's unexpectedly because, like, on the one hand, this one, anarchism and American traditions, is more obviously relevant to the course, right? Um, and whereas on the other hand, this one, the dominant idea, so th th which is not really directly about anarchism at all, right? Although it's clearly related somehow. Um, but, you know, this one is, so to speak, more obviously philosophical. Um, like, I think if I were to insert her into my 19th century course, which there isn't room for, but anyway, if I were, <laughs> um, you know, I would basically just talk about this, like in order to compare her to like Schelling and Emerson and whatever. But um, but for one reason or another, it seems like actually like what I really want to focus on is, is mostly in this one and then secondarily in the other two. Um, however, I guess the obvious place to begin is with the end, where well, it is with what she says in anarchism and American traditions. So, um, because like, um, so um, on the one hand, the the whole point of this essay is like to claim a kind of like American lineage for anarchism. So um, a, a specifically or a particularly American lineage for anarchism. Um, so like to convince you that anarchism is like as American as mom and apple pie, so to speak. Um, and basically the story is that the founders at least the good founders, right? So, I mean, so the good founders are like Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine. Um, the bad founders are like Hamilton and Madison. Um, she, 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 she treats them as being basically monarchists. Um, but the good founders like Jeff Jefferson and Paine, um, you know, they have the right instincts, they had the right principle, they had the right idea or something, but they lacked um, they lacked faith. 
right? They didn't they didn't trust liberty sufficiently. Actually, here's here's the exact quote. So this is on page 131 in Anarchism in American Traditions. Um, The sin of our the sin our fathers sinned was that they did not trust liberty wholly. They thought it possible to compromise between liberty and government, believing the latter to be a necessary evil. Right, so that's the story. So that they really like, I mean, so to speak, should have been anarchists, but they just didn't. They didn't dare. They didn't trust. That liberty would take care of itself without government. Um, and so, I mean, it's part of this that aim of the essay that the good founders, Jefferson and Payne, are, are treated as more or less uncontroversially heroes. Um, I mean, like, there's a lot of um, quoting of Thomas Jefferson, but no mention of his slaves. <laughs> um, like, what what was the sin that he sinned in that? You know, so, um, um, and in fact, and I mean, I guess, I mean, it's worth emphasizing this, especially because we're going on to Du Bois next, and like, you know, We'll see that he, like he famously starts by saying the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, right? So, I mean, you can see why he has to say that because these people that we've been reading um, like seem to think the problem of the 20th century is anything but that, <laughs> right? And Declare says, this is in Anarchism on page 110, in this country, Outside of the Negro question, we have never had the historic division of classes. The outside of the, <laughs> you know, that's like uh, um, to mention something historically close, right? But, you know, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you like the play? <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. So anyway, um, um, and you know, similarly, there's you, you know, in a lot of places, she play, she praises the Puritans and the colonial Americans, right? I mean, because so part of this story is that you know, she says colonial America gradually developed this awareness of the of, uh, principle of liberty or whatever, and um, um, and the, the when the revolution happened. The essence of the revolution not was not those battles that they fought, but like people um, saying, uh, you know, we want to replace the old version of government with, with a new one that's that's supposed to be compatible with liberty. So, um, right, and again, the idea is that it was the conditions in colonial America that that um, made that possible, but. Um, but without discussing what happened to the indigenous people <laughs> um, and how that fits in to this, you know, like uh, growing consciousness of liberty. Um, although, you know, again, as with the quote unquote Negro question, it's not like she's not aware of that. Right? I mean, on the contrary, she, she mentions this as part of her argument part of her explanation. So it comes in when she's trying to explain why Americans are not attracted to communism. And it starts, we in America never knew the village commune. Why? White civilization, the capital C for some reason, white civilization struck our shores in a broad tide sheet and swept over the country inclusively. Among us was never seen the little commune growing up from a state of barbarism independently out of primary industries and maintaining itself, itself within itself. There was no gradual change from the mode of life of the native people to our own, 
there was a wiping out and a complete transplantation of the latest form of European civilization. So she knows that happened. I mean, she, I mean, well, not just that you know that happens, but she describes it in um, straightforward terms, right? Like there's no like Thanksgiving story or whatever. <laughs> there was a wiping out, and then, but somehow that's not, you know, like that's kind of beside the point here, or something like that. I mean, maybe it is. I'm just maybe it is beside the point, but it's anyway. It's at least worth noticing that that's happening. Um, but so anyway, that those those are kind of <laughs> now I'm doing the same thing myself, right? I mean, I, I was going to say those are kind of side points. Um, but I mean, I guess they are side points in the in, in the in the thing I want to say about this essay, which is. That okay, so the, so on the one hand, the point of the essay is to show that anarchism is really American. But um, on the other hand, as we've seen before, this kind of like American tradition threatens to be self-undermining in the sense that uh, the conclusion is that tradition itself is un-American. Rather, it's European, I guess, you know, is what you would fill in there. Um, and to Claire, in the end of the essay, uh, you know, basically reaches that conclusion. Um, so the thing about it being American, you say it was just rhetorical? Maybe that's, maybe that's putting it too strongly. But it is, like I said, it's, It shows that what's really American is, in the end, not being American, basically. Right, so this is the end of this essay. Um, um, uh, so like, if anarchism ever succeeds, she says, then may, may we hope to see a resurrection of that proud spirit of our fathers, which put the simple dignity of man above the gods of wealth and class. And that is gods, not with the, the, the gods class. <laughs> um, I think that's pronounced god. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's gao. Anyway, a wealth and class and health that to be and held that to be an American was greater than to be a king. And there's a paragraph break and then she says, in that day, there shall be neither kings nor Americans, only men, over the whole earth, men. <laughs> there again, for us, the moment is spoiled by the men. <laughs> but, but that's what she says, right? So, um, um, right, so again, like trying to keep from being thrown off track by that, like worrying about why we're saying men there all of a sudden, but she, you know, what she's saying is in the day when the spirit of the revolution truly succeeds, there won't be Americans anymore. Um, and so this is the thing I've basically been promising all along, right? There's someone who like agrees with Bentham about the implications of the Declaration of Independence, but the Declaration of Independence really uh, um, means that the principles of it, uh, you know, imply that there can't be any government, and so it can't be used to justify setting up your own separate government and, you know, putting people in prison and all that stuff that Bentham complains about. Um, and someone who agrees with that and and bites the bullet and says, yeah, that's what the implications mean, and that's what I think. Uh, or that's what the principles of the Declaration mean, and that's what. I think, right? And the, so the conclusion is that, you know, on the one hand, 
no government whatsoever is consistent with liberty. And on the other hand, the border between America and elsewhere, and generally like the separateness of nations or peoples, um, um, has no moral significance. Um, and, you know, like that, does it excuse or does it make it worse? But it somehow goes together with what I was pointing out before. So the, like, in that time when there's neither kings nor Americans, so like somehow the problem of indigenous people versus settlers or white versus black or whatever is just like it's silently for so presupposed that it's going to disappear if we just get rid of this government. Um, but like, but again, remember the conditions that made that possible included this like um, wiping out and <laughs> transplantation of European civilization to our continent. Um, okay, so anyway, leaving aside those those like those worries, leaving putting them back in the basement, whether they're the rattling around. Anyway, just like anyway, leaving aside those worries for now. Uh, um, the, the, so by the time you get to the end of the essay, the position is. Uh, pretty straightforward. It's, you know, like that is, in a sense, you could say the problem that all the authors are worrying over in this course, and the authors after this are also going to be worrying over, she just says, well, I, just, I don't accept the terms of that problem. You know, how can there be a particular nation, America? Well, I mean, there can't be, or there shouldn't be. Um, so you might think there's kind of nothing to say about this, but then, of course, Declare has lots and lots of things to say about it. Um, so, so what is it that she talks about? So the, a lot of it is about property. Um, um, and I guess especially material property. That is the things that we buy and own. Um, and it comes up in all three of the essays. Um, um, that somehow the, um, the message of anarchism Well, so, I mean, yeah, I guess put it this way, there's some relationship which remains to be clarified between the message of anarchism and this other message, like, for example, on page 101 in, um, in the essay, Anarchism, it says, uh, um, Oh, I'm on page 100. There we go. Be men first of all, not held in slavery by the things you make. Let your gospel be things for men, not men for things. Um, right, so that's the version of it in the first essay. Um, in the second essay, the Anarchism in American tradition. Um, like, so this is the results, I think, 
or in, uh, maybe that's not the right way to put it. Like, so, you know, the founding fathers, or again, the good founding fathers, thought they could reach some compromise between liberty and government. And then they could confine government within grounds by setting up, you know, uh, some system where, like, it would always be carefully watched over. Um, and she has a long explanation of why that didn't work and couldn't possibly have worked. Um, but um, a big part of it, the part that has to do, she says there's three parts. One is the essence of government, one is the essence of human nature, and one is the essence of commerce and manufacture. So the part that has to do with the essence of human nature um, basically comes down to this. This is on page 128. The love of material ease has been, in the mass of men and permanently speaking, always greater than the love of liberty. Right? So that's what that's part of what made this compromise solution impossible. Um, and it, you know, made it impossible because uh, people couldn't be trusted to keep watch over the government and keep it limited because they would, you know, given a choice between um, um, resisting the government and uh, it, 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 basically they could be bribed into, <laughs> um, they could be bribed by a material ease into like accepting whatever government uh, wanted to impose on them. Um, and then, so, I mean, these versions are a little bit different, right? Like the first one says, don't be, don't be slaves to the things you make. So it's like, the, but it's, the problem is that somehow uh, worrying about your material property is a version of not having liberty in and of itself. In this one, it's more like, it's like the weakness that will, that will cause you to give away your liberty. Um, and, um, The dominant idea, I guess maybe it's some of both, but it comes to a climax in this uh, hilarious passage. This is on page 15. Do not fool yourself by saying you would like to help usher in a free society, but you cannot sacrifice an armchair for it. Say honestly, I love armchairs better than free men and pursue them because I choose, not because circumstances make me. <laughs> and then, this is, the, this is the best part. I love hats, large, large hats with many feathers and great bows. And I would rather have those hats than trouble myself about social dreams that will never be accomplished in my day. The world worships hats, and I wish to worship with them. And this is especially funny because here's a picture of Jane Adams. <laughs> if, like if you Google Jane Adams hat, you'll find like a, you'll find like a hundred pictures of like this. I don't know if it's aimed specifically at her or if it's just or I mean because. I, or if it's just probably like those reformers in general who were like of the same, moved in the same circles as her, wore, you know, at that time wore these huge hats. <laughs> uh, so, anyway, that's like, that's what she's. So, in the, in the dominant idea, the thought is that. Um, um, It's complicated. I mean, again, it's your your devotion to these material things is somehow preventing you from um, from seeking liberty. Um, but 
um, worse than that or making that worse, your, your conviction that um, we're all at the mercy of material circumstances is making it impossible for you to take responsibility. Right, so that's what, you know, so like you're saying, well, I would like to seek a free society, but under these circumstances, I can't do it. Um, and she says, don't blame it on the circumstances, be honest. You mean I love hats and <laughs> I can't seek a free society because I need to, I don't have time, I'm seeking hats. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, it's a harsh diagnosis of someone like Jane Dunn, Jane Adams. But Tolstoy said something similar to her when she met, that's one of the stories about Jane Adams, that she met Tolstoy and she was like really impressed to meet him and all excited and but she was wearing some kind of fancy dress with huge sleeves and he like looked at her sleeve and said like, I don't know, like this sleeve would feed a peasant for a year or something like that. Uh, so um, um, so it's a, it's a rather harsh criticism. I mean, whether it's fair or not, I'm not sure, but that's, you know, that's, that's the point she's making. She, She's making two points. Number one, those hats and sleeves and armchairs are like that when Adam says, well, we don't want to let go of the like hardly one, you know, law and order. So declare is, is saying, what you mean is you don't want to let go of your armchairs and hats. <laughs> um but you won't even you won't even say it that honest way, even to yourself. Um, okay, well, um, so this is the this is a version of something that we've seen before, and we'll see again in other authors. Right, like, um, you know, um, that American ideals are threatened because Americans, and sometimes it's oftentimes it's kind of like Americans nowadays, like young people these days, or whatever, right? The Americans nowadays only care about care about money and or material possessions. It's not 100% clear that money is a material possession. <laughs> um, I guess uh, I mean, it's like, well, it's clear that our money is not a material possession. Right? Like, when you when I get paid, nothing happens but that some, like, numbers and some computers change. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but even if you're on the gold standard, I mean, I guess, you know, Marx's analysis was that gold is a commodity like any other, and its value comes from the labor of extracting it. But that's not obviously a really good analysis. So anyway, I'm sorry, that's kind of a kind of a digression. But I mean, but it may be important actually because. Um, because Declare um, doesn't talk about money as much as a lot of other people do when she makes this complaint. Because she focuses on things like archers and hats. <laughs> um, so, uh, but in any case, it's a version of this. This, I mean, we'll see uh, um, a version of it in Du Bois in his essay of the wings of Atalanta is like all about the same issue that gold is, you know, or money or material possessions um, are what's holding us back. And um, um, it's maybe a little bit 
surprise me that we'll see it there. I mean, because if you say be men, first of all, not held in slavery by the things you make, you might think that we would have a more literal worry about slavery in mind. But, uh, but in any case, no, it's, we'll see it through voice. And, and uh, so, uh, um, but like the different people have different versions of this worry. And I, I said something like, about the, the way it occurs in these three essays, but I want to go into more detail. And I guess this is where I feel like the detail she goes into in this essay about the ways that, um, the different ways you can think of property as being related to governments are useful for trying to understand what's going on. So, Right, and so that like basically the issue is the relationship between individual liberty or so like we forget about money from, for the moment. So property, like there's there's material property. Things. But then there's also what you might call original property. Right? So, like when um, Locke explains the origin of material property, right? He says, how, so first of all, he, 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 um, proves or asserts anyway that the that uh in the state of nature in the original state of nature um the whole world was uh was a giant commons it belonged to everyone in common and then the question was how could it come to be that um some people got a right to exclude others from a certain part of the world. And he's especially thinking about real property that is land, although he doesn't talk about that first. Like he talks about acorns or <laughs> something. Um, but, you know, so like, how could that be? And he says, well, um, it's because uh, although the whole world was a commons, that doesn't mean people didn't have property. They had property in their own person. By the law of nature, they have property in their own person and in their own actions. And then, you know, when they, for example, pick up acorns from the ground and put them in a pile, they create a new thing that wasn't part of the world originally. And the new thing is, so to speak, a mixture of the acorns that were there before and their labor. <laughs> right? Um, and since it's not the kind of mixture that you can take apart into its ingredients again, <laughs> it now becomes theirs. Um, you know, that's roughly speaking how it's supposed to work. Um, so, um, um, so, you know, so Declare is worried about this same question about the relationship between this kind of property and this kind of property. But of course, unlike Locke, she's not going to use one to explain the other. <laughs> um, she's going to ask how, like, how comes that one interferes with the other, basically. Um, and you know, so um, this is a this is a universal problem. But it's a universal problem in such a way that it's a specifically American problem. Because as you can see from like one of the inalienable rights listed in the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So I mean, life and liberty go here, right? You have a you have property in your own body, first of all, that other people don't have a right to kill you. 
And second of all, that other people don't have a right to constrain you. Uh, so like imprison you. Um, and then the question is, um, how is that related to the pursuit of happiness? Um, if you think the pursuit of happiness is the pursuit of things, <laughs> Um, um, and sometimes people claim that that's what the words mean in the Declaration of Independence. You know, I, I mean, I think that they do and they don't. I don't think that um, that Jefferson would think that happiness means wealth, as, as people as sometimes people claim. But I think he does think that we can't be happy without it, as as does Locke and Hobbes and Ray. The like, I mean, you know, the the. You know, does he think that? Then what about what he said about the Indians? That is the American Indians, the Native Americans. Maybe they were happier. He thinks under he thinks under our circumstances we can't be happy with them. I mean, they, you know, because he he says that uh, that we can't live. There's too many of us. We can't live the way that American Indians live. So anyway, so right. So there's so so this is a specifically American question. It's about the you know. Or, I mean, I guess another way to say it, see it is the thing in Thoreau about it was a principle our fathers fought for, and not to avoid a three cent tax on their cup of tea, <laughs> right? Like, um, um. How is the principle of liberty related to the principle of private property? So, like, and so on the one hand, we have the communist or socialist anarchists who analyze the relationship this way. They say, you know, um, the coercive. Uh, power of judgment of government originated as um, a project of creating or defending the institution of property. Um, and in order to do that, it was necessary to restrain liberty. And I mean, it's like so, like so far, they agree with Hobbes. But then they draw the, the opposite conclusion, right? That like, therefore, in order to have liberty, we have to give up on having property. Um, um, I mean, so like it's it's this that's simplest in Hobbes, but you know, like according to Locke, um According to Locke, there could be property without government. There was property before there was government, or, or there could have been anyway. It's not clear when he thinks he's telling the actual history of the world. And when he's, but, you know, so there was property before there was government, but property wasn't very secure before there was government. And it, it seems like, you know, like the, the, uh, Kind of event that happened that triggered the formation of government was the institution of money, which allowed a separation between rich and poor. It doesn't. I don't think Locke says that straight out. The way Rousseau Rousseau says government begins with a, a war between the rich and the poor, and the rich trick the poor into thinking that government will be better for everyone. <laughs> right. So, but anyway, so like, I mean, choose whatever version of that story makes sense to you. The the, uh, the anarchists and socialists, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, communist and socialist anarchists say um, that, you know, the bad thing about government is 
that it's that it's it's set up to create property by restricting liberty and so like getting rid of government means getting rid of property and that's all for the better um but then on the other hand she says there's the individualist anarchist um and as i said like um that was, she's talking about at least partly her own past self when she talked about this, I think. So the individualist anarchists, well, I mean, it, it's actually not only her own past self. So let me, let me read what she says. Um, this particular branch of the anarchist party does not accept the communist position that government arises from property. They lay more stress upon its, I'm skipping a little bit while I'm going to come back to the part I'm skipping. They lay more stress upon its metaphysical origin in the authority creating fear in human nature. Right? So, according to these people, um, the government started as a kind of uh, superstition. <laughs> right? Um, um, fear, she capitalizes the word fear there, a fear that creates authority. I mean, I don't know exactly how this is supposed to work in detail, but um, um, I mean, you imagine that there's that, that religion is part of this story. Um, Rousseau actually also talks about that as the origin of government, but it seems that's the origin of a different kind of government. The origin of the kind of government that Rousseau likes is that the, the legislator, you know, comes up with the correct, uh, uh, like, institutional structure and brings it before the whole people for them to vote on it and accept it. But Rousseau says the people are not going to like understand that this is the best structure for a government. So what is the legislator going to do? And he says, well, the legislator has to claim the gods told me. <laughs> right. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, then he actually mentions, according to the legends, about the founding of Sparta and the founding of Rome and whatever. But that's how it was. All right. So, um, so these people think that government has some kind of religious origin, um, and uh, um, and that it's uh, basically freeing ourselves from government is not freeing the poor from the rich, but freeing like ourselves from a kind of spiritual error. Um, um, and therefore, I mean, or this goes together with this is what allows them. I don't know which is that this that is one implies the other, but that's what allows them to also think that, um, that as she puts it, government doesn't create the property. Government actually prevents there from being real property. Right? That is, people left to their own would understand that some things belong to me and other things belong to you, and I'm not allowed to interfere with you. But once we get involved in this, like, um, religious uh, or quasi religious feeling that someone has authority over us, we start to. Um, uh, the, the authority we think they have is the authority to take our property, do something else. Um, um, and, you know, uh, so like, and the relationship between these two things then would, would be that, I mean, I guess to begin with, government wants to interfere with both of them, but like, it's especially wants to interfere with, with your personal liberty. 
but um, depriving you of your absolute right to your own property is, is a way of getting it. Which, I mean, it is, right? Like when you hear people say, uh, um, you should care about people, not about property. Well, attacking someone's property is a way of attacking. <laughs> I mean, uh, like if someone comes to your village and bulldozes all the houses down, you, like, like your reaction is not, oh, thank you. Counts, they only attack my property. <laughs> but, so anyway, so like that's you know that's what um, the individualist anarchist think. Um, and as I said, uh, apparently, um, the Claire herself started with that individualist view and then moved. Um, and uh, I mean, it's not clear, and I guess it's controversial among her biographers and whatever, exactly what her final position was. Um, uh, but it seems like it wasn't any of the forms she discusses here exactly. At least anyway, what she said here in 1901, maybe she changed her mind more later. I mean, that, there are some things, especially the dominant idea, that might make you think that. But, right, because the thing about, like, should I really care about government taking away my absolute right to my hats and my armchair? Or does that show that I'm still somehow enslaved? So, like, I mean, the analysis may be different from the communist analysis she's talking about here, but the result might be sim more similar. In any case, in 1901, she says that she she's she she doesn't find any of these uh, theories completely satisfactory. She doesn't find their prescriptions completely satisfactory. I guess. Um, because, like, on the one hand, the communist and socialist anarchists prescribe that. Um, no one's allowed to have more than anyone else, and no one's have, allowed to have control over, you know, their own property and keep other people off it. Um, and she says, well, that seems to require a degree of control that's inconsistent with that. Right? Like, what's going to happen if I suddenly take all kinds of stuff? Who's going to stop me? <laughs> um, so, like, if you're a non-anarchist socialist, the answer is easy: the government's going to stop, right? But if you're an anarchist socialist, you're saying, "I'm not sure." But then, on the other hand, she says the individualist one. Well, uh, I'm not sure about that one either, because she says it seems it it seems to imply an idea of uh, private police, which is not really consistent with anarchism, right? Because that. Because, you know, so who's going to protect my my thing in this system? And the answer is, well, first of all, I can't force you to pay to protect my thing. So I'll have to pay for that myself. So I'll so if I if I'm rich, I'll pay for like, you know, some thugs to defend my property. <laughs> and that doesn't seem like it leaves everyone else their full liberty. <laughs> So, you know, so she said neither of those are completely satisfactory, but I mean, but the main point of this essay, anarchism, is actually to, to say that we don't have to choose between one of these things in order to be anarchists. I mean, That might be true from a certain logical point of view without being pragmatically true, right? It's like, suppose it turned out that every version of the economic arrangement under anarchism was really unsatisfactory <laughs> and you couldn't think of an alternative. So then obviously that would have some implications for the principle itself, right? But anyway, you know, but she's saying like, um, 
just taking it from the point of view that we're all like here, we're all anarchists here, right? And she's saying, and there's no point in us fighting over which one of these is right. And the reason there's no point in fighting over which one of these is right is that um, anarchists as such should be worrying about the removal of coercion. And you know what that means is that I shouldn't hope in the future to coerce you into my favorite economics. So I should be thinking that the people who agree with me will agree with me and set up this system, and the other people will do something else. Um, This, you know, maybe makes assumptions about how much land is available that, that are not necessarily realistic. Um, even then, maybe we're not realistic, certainly not now when there's so many more people. Um, I'm not I'm not sure, but 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 beyond that, um it's uh, the thing that's interesting about it is that. She presents it as so we don't have to decide between individualism and socialism and whatever. But, and I mean, maybe that's true in a like strictly economic understanding of those things. But in another sense, it's she's really, um, it's really a stronger form of individualism. I mean, even economically speaking, like, so what's going to happen once the revolution comes and there's no more government? And then we say everyone is free to decide whether they want to be a member of a commune or whether they want to be a member of this, you know, libertarian property owning community. So, like, the rich people are probably going to say, I, I want to be a member of the libertarian community, right? And so, the like, um, um, the poor people will be able to have all their. Um, insufficient possessions in common if they want, but they can't do what they really want, which is to have the rich people's possessions in common. Um, so, like, so, so, you know, this version of it really, in the end, emphasizes that individualism, I think, more. Um, uh, I mean, like, Yeah, I guess, you know, it's, a, it's because the situation isn't symmetric, right? Like, if if I get to keep my property, I don't care if those other people have their property in common. Why would I care about that? <laughs> right? I mean, so under a government, you might care, right? Because you say, like, those people are starting, you know, they're socializing medicine or whatever, right? And you're, like, worried that the next step is they're going to take away your property. Um, but if they don't have a government to coerce you, um, why would you care? Whereas obviously, if you're one of the people who has the stuff in common, it makes a big difference to you that some other people are keeping your own property. Mm -hmm. Right. So anyway, but um, um, so in that sense, I guess at least in 1901, that she she remains really more of an individualist than she's letting on. Um, but she also, and this maybe is more interesting, um, whatever the reasons for her move away from individualism towards something else, uh, she continues to agree with the individualists about the origin of government, right? That is, she thinks the, she thinks that the socialists and communists are wrong that government just originated in order to create and protect property. Um, and, um, right, she says this in a number of places that uh, from 10, page 105, Anarchism. Um, she 
If I may venture at this point a criticism of this position of the anarchist socialist, I would say that the great flaw in this conception of the state is supposing it to be of simple origin. The state is not merely the tool of the governing classes. It has its root far down in the religious development of human nature and will not fall apart merely through the abolition of classes and property. So that in 1901, he continues to think that, that I mean, maybe there's a hint there that there's a kind of mixture of the two. It's not merely a tool of the governing classes, so that, but, um, but, you know, when she says it has its root far down in the religious development of human nature, I think she's saying that the basic origin of it is more like what the individualists thought. So, like the, um, I guess in some ways, you, what you might think would be the logical upshot of that would be that you would say, um, right, so to have the right conception of anarchism, um, how you think about economic arrangements is not so that, that important because this isn't basically an economic problem. This is basically a, a um, religious problem. And so like what anarchists have to do is fight a kind of religious war and so the important thing would be to get your your manifest. <laughs> and I think that that is something that she thought before. Again, right? I mean, she says that basically that that's something she used to think, and then now she doesn't. Um, right? She says that about herself that she at one time asserted very stoutly that no one could be an anarchist and believe in God at the same time. You know, because, I don't know why I keep pointing to this, <laughs> you know, because the, if the origin of the state is in this authority creating fear, which is the, which is the root of religious development in human nature, um, uh, you know, um, the only way to overcome that is to overcome that fear, and to overcome that fear means, you know, believe, not believing that there is a God. But now she says the same thing about these metaphysical or religious questions that she said about the economic ones, that they're, you know, it's, it's not that important as long as we all agree to be uh, anarchists. So it, this is on page 97. The chain of reasoning, which once appeared so conclusive to me, namely that, anar that anarchism, being a denial of authority over the individual, could not coexist with the belief in a supreme ruler of the universe, is contradicted in the case of Leo Tolstoy, who comes to the conclusion that none has a right to rule another just because of his belief in God. And, you know, by the way, like, as she more or less admits that um, she wouldn't have to reach for Tolstoy, for an example. She could have used Jonathan Edwards. <laughs> she would been reading Jonathan Edwards. Um, although, I mean, again, I'm not, I don't know that, or I'm fairly sure that Jonathan Edwards was not explicitly an anarchist or else we would all have heard about that, right? <laughs> but, um, but that does seem to be an implication of what he's saying, not very deeply hidden. Um, and, um, I, you know, I think even, I mean, she says, again, she says rel relatively nice things about the Puritans. I think she's thinking of that. I don't know if she's thinking of Edwards in particular, but she's thinking of that side of Puritan religion. That, um, that tends towards that kind of conclusion. And remember, I mean, who were the Puritans, right? The Puritans were people who refused to acknowledge that the king was the head of the Church of England. Um, and they would not take uh, oath that, you know, so they were persecuted. 
Um, so, but getting back to what I was saying, this is a little bit, you know, it's a little bit strange. If the if the problem is fundamentally a religious type of problem, then how can it be that um, well, but really your religious belief doesn't matter here? So I think what's happening is that it's really a lot like the case of the economic. Like what looks like tolerating an alternative to individualism really turns out when you look into it to be like a stronger and deeper form of individualism. So, you know, I mean, like this is what she says about Tolstoy later on in the essay. This is on page 115. And she describes Tolstoy, right? There's Tolstoy, Christian non-resistant artist. His method is blah, blah, blah. And then she says, Good, I accept it in its entirety. It fits his character, it fits his ability. Let us be glad that he works so. So, you know, I think what she thinks she's learned about this is from the case of Tolstoy is that, um, It's okay for Tolstoy to acknowledge God as the ruler of the universe because, and insofar as, that's really his free individual approach. So, I mean, I'm not sure what this means about, like, what is the really the root of religious development and human nature or whatever. Um, um, like, um, doesn't give at least here. I mean, she she wrote a lot of other stuff besides what I assigned. Um, um, I, I read a lot more than what I assigned. I don't remember her talking about this anywhere. But um, but uh, um, but in any case, I mean, I think you can you can see what the lesson would be maybe by turning around and imagining a case of someone who's an atheist, but why are they an atheist? Well, maybe because it's like fashionable or conventional in the circles they, they move in, or maybe because their parents are atheists, like John Stuart Mill, whose father was an atheist, um, or maybe because they live in officially atheist states like Soviet Russia, right? So, um, so like in those cases, actually the root of atheism is somehow the authority creating fear, right? So it, like, um, I, I think the point is that you can't, maybe you can't read out of the, the he doesn't say this, I'm, but, but this is the way a lot of philosophers traditionally think about religion. But it's kind of a symbolic expression of, of a philosophical truth, and you, you know you you could you could take her as having learned that you can't just straightforwardly read off the symbol what it symbolizes, whether it symbolizes freedom or or subjection or whatever. Um, so. Um, Right, so like kind of the, the the moral of everything I've been saying is that, and I guess it's not a very surprising moral, except that um, um, she's actually had to do a lot of work to get to the point where it's not surprising, which is that for her, you know, uh, that for her, the basis of anarchism is really a kind of strong individualism. And, you know, for reasons I've been emphasizing all along, that goes together with a strong universalism, right? It, every, it means every individual faces the same requirements or something like that. Um, 
So, and you know, and this kind of individualism, again, maybe uh, unsurprisingly, um, brings her very close to Thoreau. Um, and very far from Royce or Al. Right? I mean, their whole point is that this kind of individualism is impossible. Um, so, however, I think there's, I think there's, I mean, it's not clear, but I think there's some kind of subtle differences between her and Thoreau, and they could be brought up by, by asking how they would respond to Royce or Adams. You know, you hear talk about words, but I think a lot of this could be adopted to think to talk about Adams as well. So, I mean, like remembering Royce's catalog of the forms of individuals, and there were these two bad forms. They're bad because they're inconsistent with loyalty, right? I mean, there was also, I get, I didn't think of this at the time, but there were kind of two good forms and two bad forms, right? And Royce said about the two good forms that they're not really inconsistent with loyalty. And the people who think that this is an objection to loyalty are misunderstanding themselves. And the two bad forms really are inconsistent with loyalty, but they're bad, <laughs> right? So, um, and the two bad forms, and as I said, it wasn't, seems like Royce is probably attributing one of the bad forms to Thoreau, but it's not clear which. With Thoreau and Emerson, it's probably more likely to be thinking about Emerson than Thoreau. So I'm not sure. So anyway, like, so the right one form was that kind of <clears throat> selfish individualism. Where people, <clears throat> where people say, mm, shock us. <clears throat> Sorry. Where people say, you know, uh, um, we have rights, they worry about their rights and not their duties. And they say <clears throat> that um, for the modern man, Yes, the modern woman also, as we are sometimes told, um, the um, the most the highest thing is their right to the completest possible self development and fullest self expression, which the conditions of our social life will furnish. That's right, and that's the one. That's the form where Royce says, like the selfish, we have always we have had always with us. Like, this is the first time everyone anyone's tried to. Win. Defend selfishness in such high pollution metaphysical terms. And the, the other bad form was um, this is not a quote from Royce. Those who seek and who believe that they find an interior spiritual light which guides them and which relieves them of the need of any loyalty to externally visible causes. So I think Royce could apply one or the other of these, but again, it's not sure clear which to declare as well. Um, I mean, it's a little bit complicated because in one sense, like Royce could treat declare or Thoreau, at least Thoreau of civil disobedience. I'm not so sure about Walden. But Thoreau, like Royce, could treat them like that earnest young son of Russian immigrants and say, look, there is something you're loyal to. Like, in particular, you could say to declare, you're loyal to anarchism. <laughs> um, you're loyal to a cause. Um, but I think that declare and Thoreau will, you know, um, 
is a moment where they say something like, but this is a cause that you could never sacrifice your individuality to. That would be incoherent. So that is like, you couldn't possibly kneel down and say, I am the servant of the anarchists and I have no eye to speak, to see nor time to speak save as they command me. Right? Like if they're commanding you, they're not anarchists. <laughs> um, I, at least not if anarchism is understood in the deep sense in which Declare understands it in her, the end of this essay, and then especially um, implicitly in the dominant idea. And I guess also Thoreau implicitly in Walden. Right, and they, they, they actually, they literally both say, well, for, you know, so, uh, Kind of assumed that Clara has read well, then she might be alluding to it. I don't know, but they they literally both say, like, let everyone mind their own business, <laughs> right? Um, so, um, so I think, yeah, they really are, you know, from Royce's point of view, he has to look at them as either being selfish or as like. Um, misguidingly looking inside for the, the light that will guide them when really it has to come from outside. It has to come from a, a, a cause that the social order provides. So how are they going to answer Royce's argument? And Royce's argument is, again, in both cases, like why are these things bad? Because um, because they're not possible. <laughs> I mean, that, maybe that sounds kind of like a contradiction. Like, if they're not possible, then they're not bad. But I guess, I mean, the point being that, like, if it were really true that there was such a thing as seeking your own self development, um, and that that could provide you with an overall aim in life, then um, Royce. Uh, wouldn't object to it and wouldn't call it selfish, selfish. But that, but according to Royce, that's not really possible. Um, so, um, and why is it not really possible? Well, so Royce says the natural individual is just a chaos of competing desires. So there is no individuality to be expressed to begin with. In order to have individuality, you have to first have loyalty. That will organize your desires and whatever, and then you can be, you know, your own self. Um, as he keeps emphasizing, as William Lentful was, he was his own self. He wasn't following precedent. He, you know, he made his own decision, but it was only possible because of his loyalty. So, um, so how are Thoreau and Declare going to respond to this? And I think now I probably shouldn't try to summarize what Thoreau would say to this. <laughs> That's probably pretty foolhardy. And what I'm about to say may really be closer to Emerson than Thoreau. But like I think Thoreau would say something like. But that chaos that you see when you just introspect into yourself is only apparent, right? And the important thing is that you have faith that there is an order behind it. There must be an order behind it, right? So this is this, this is uh, what Kant would call a postulate of rational faith, right? There must be, um, I mean, it leads to a non-Kantian conclusion. But there it is, the postulate of rational faith. There must be an order to that chaos because I must be able to be it myself without someone else telling me what to do. Um, whereas Declare seems to say at the end of the anarchism essay um, that 
the ultimate purpose of anarchism is to unleash that chaos. <laughs> um, right, so like, uh, uh, this is page 113. And before this, she's been saying, uh, you know, if what anarchism means to you is to free yourself from capitalism and not have a boss ordering around and whatever, she says, that's good, that's fine, right? But anarchism could mean so much more than that, right? And that's when she goes into this thing about um, um, uh, wants to stand unflinchingly on the brink of that dark gulf of passions and desires. Once at last, to send a bold, straight driven gaze down into the volcanic lee. Once, and in that once, and in that once forever, to throw off the command to cover and flee from the knowledge of that abyss. And a little bit farther down, once and forever to realize that one is not a bundle of well regulated little reasons bound up in the front room of the brain to be sermonized and held in order with copybook maxims to move and stop by a syllogism, but a bottomless, bottomless depth of all strange sensations, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so um, she's, it sounds like she's agreeing with Rice, that when you look in, inside yourself, you won't find um, like, uh, um, you won't find, if you look on yourself honestly, you'll find that there is no organizing principle. And, you know, I mean, I think to Royce's suggestion that you could import one from the outside, I, I think, you know, that thing about your mind being a little bundle of reasons that could be sermonized, I, I, you can almost take it as directed against Royce. Yeah, I don't, again, I don't see any evidence that she was reading Royce or the first reading her. I, uh, certainly possible, but I know. But, I mean, you could, you could see it as directed against a view like Royce's, saying that all that would accomplish basically is to cover over that chaos, and, you know, to make it invisible. Um, 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 Now, so at this point, like Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche at this, I'm going to say Nietzsche, at this point, De Claire starts to sound like she could be close to Nietzsche. Um, she actually does mention Nietzsche in uh, another essay called Anarchism and Literature. She mentions Nietzsche along with Walt Whitman towards the end. She says very little about Nietzsche there, and it's not clear that there's, it wasn't clear to me that she's been reading Nietzsche carefully based on what she said. But, um, but uh, and certainly, for, uh, there's nothing certain in this world, but <laughs> I'd be very surprised to hear that Nietzsche was reading De Claire. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it was translated to German, and in any case, we know what he thought about, I don't see, we know what he thought about women. We don't, I mean, we know what he, he said in some cases. I, but in any case, it does not consistent with what he did necessarily. So, but, um, um, but it would be interesting to compare this with Nietzsche's depiction of the anarchist. Um, in um, Zarathustra, there's this monster called the fire dog that lives in a volcano. And, uh, and I think it becomes clear that, that, that that's Nietzsche's representation of anarchists. And the, you know, the fire dog uh, um, makes a lot of noise and more is a big roar, but in the end, there's really not much to it, according to me. So like, I don't know whether, I mean, the volcano thing, <laughs> that she mentions the volcanic me, but I, I guess it's, 
I mean, you could say she's been reading Zarathustra, and this is her answer to Zarathustra somehow, but I, I, I that doesn't seem plausible to me. So I guess maybe it's just a coincidence. But in any case, they, you know, I mean, that could provide a, a place for starting to understand what they agree and disagree about, I guess. Um, and um, um, the other question is whether this view that she has has at the end of the anarchism paper is really the same as what she says in the dominant idea. Um, I mean, right, like the beginning of that essay on everything that lives, if one looks searchingly, is limed or limbed, limbed I think, the shadow of an idea, this, this word. Mm -hmm. Like sketch, basically, you know. So uh, um, that sounds like Emerson, they, you know, everywhere, and well, like Kant too, I guess. I think like everywhere you look, you'll find the shadow of an idea. Um, so, like, that makes it sound that if you look searchingly into yourself, you would find the shadow of an idea. And then, you know, and the, the problem of the essay, the dominant idea is, it, I mean, it has something to do with um, the possibility of, well, I'll just, just read what she goes on to say that because it's, um, When everything that lives, if one looks searching, searchingly, is looms the shadow of an idea, an idea dead or living, sometimes stronger when dead, with rigid, unswerving lines that mark the living embodiment of the stern, immobile past of the non living. Right? So you will find an idea when you look inside yourself, but the problem is whether it's a living idea or a dead idea. <laughs> Um, and, uh, um, and if it's a dead idea, I'm not sure this interpretation is right, but I'll go, I'll, I'll press on with it anyway. <laughs> but if it's a dead idea, you have to get rid of it and have your own living dominant idea. I mean, the reason I'm not sure it's right is because. Like when she talks about the Egyptians or the Greeks, they, you know, she has this. This is her theory. Of, this is her periodization of history. Egypt, Greece, Middle Ages, um, like back to the system. <laughs> Something like that. So, um, so anyway, if you go from, you know, if, if she talks about Egypt or Greece or the Middle Ages, she, you know, she describes them as being ruled by one dominant idea. And that apparently, I guess, is a living dominant idea, produces art and whatever, right? But then there's individuals who aren't ruled by that dominant idea, but they have their own idea. And I mean, it doesn't seem to be random. They seem to represent later stages, right? So she says that people, the, the idea of Egypt is the idea of permanence, of like holding on, and it's like related to, to, to those two spirits she discusses at the beginning of anarchism. So that this is the, you know, whatever is must continue. Um, and whereas Greece is the dominant ideas of like, uh, change and what you know. Um, so she says that no doubt there were people walking around in the 
shadow of the pyramids who were like felt that this unchanging system was oppressive and wanted to yeah, you know, so that if there were people whose dominant idea was already that idea of Greece. Um, when she gets to the Middle Ages, it's a little bit weird because the, these people, it's, she doesn't describe people. Well, okay, you know, so the, the dominant idea of the Middle Ages was that, you know, that man is nothing and God is everything, whatever, something like that. And then um, the dominant idea now is the idea of making lots and lots of things. <laughs> um, so, uh, but she doesn't describe the people in the Middle Ages as being like, um, even in the darkest parts of the Middle Ages, there were people walking around dreaming of making lots and lots of things. <laughs> it's like, but no, there were people who were like working on science or something like that. So maybe we're missing a stage in between that she does not discuss enlightenment, renaissance, whatever, something like that. But in any case, um, um, so maybe it's not so much. I mean, I think, I guess what you should say is. That for this individual, the idea of the dominant idea of the society is death. That is, it may still be dominating them, but they're but it's not theirs. They're estranged from it. They're alienated. Um, and uh, you know, her advice to them is follow your own dominant. Um, so again, that sounds more like Emerson or Thoreau as a response to us. Um, the whole complication, which, so first of all, for once, I actually went through my notes faster than I thought I would. A whole com other complication that I wanted to have time to talk about, but now I'm not sure if I should start in on it about like what's going on with materiality in this essay. It's, you know, it's complicated, you know, so like here, they, uh, materiality enslaving us appears as, I think I said this really, I said this briefly at the beginning of the lecture, right? Like it, materiality enslaving us in the first place appears as um, the fact that uh, um, we aren't able to seek freedom because we're so busy seeking things. I mean, she it's actually so her her analysis that it's you know it's weirdly like anti-Marxist or something, like opposite, right? It's it's you know, our we're driven by like a mad desire to make lots and lots of things. And our desire to acquire things is secondary. <laughs> it comes about because we want to make so many things, and then we're like, what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, like so, so like our being wrapped up in that pursuit is what's making it impossible for us to seek liberty. Now, I mean, like that. First of all, so that means that, that this this stage is particularly bad compared to the other two. Uh, I mean, maybe she does think that. There's not really explanation for that. How did we end up with this terrible dominant idea? That's like, so to speak, dead for everyone. It doesn't give you a way of living as an individual, but it just tells you to, to, to make these ugly, superfluous things. But, they, but, but materiality also comes in throughout the essay because um, 
because a materialist understanding of history means that you don't realize the importance of the dominant idea. You don't believe there is a dominant. And then when you find yourself in this situation, you don't say the dominant idea is wrong, you're gonna have my own. You just say, unfortunately, material circumstances, are, you know, this is what I have to do. Um, and that sense of materialism is not right, like that's like metaphysical materialism. It's not like being a materialist in the sense of wanting material property. So, um, well, I said maybe I should have started this, and indeed I was right that it's but like I can't say anything more about it than just to set up that question about how those two things are related in inner mind. Because at first, they might seem to be almost the same thing, but they're really like matter is really fulfilling completely different functions. All right. Uh, on that note, we'll see you next week.